Well, Rosalind Kind, this is an absolute thrill to see you again. You know, I think about you and two words come up, showbiz sensation, and that truly is you to a T. Oh, sweetheart, thank you. That's such a nice compliment. I remember seeing you in an episode of The Nanny, which was wonderful, the fabulous Fran Drescher down on the ground, kind of kissing your feet because right. you know, <laughs> she was thinking, well, here in this room is the DNA of Barbara Streisand. You are drooling on Rosalind Shoes. Oh, it doesn't matter. They're my sisters. Get them off. <laughs> Did you have fun making that? I had a blast. Everybody on that set couldn't have been nicer. And it was just so much fun to be there with them. I think your sister Barbara Streisand is nine years your senior, is that correct? Yes, just about, a little, a little under, because my birthday's in January and hers in April. You think about your family and showbiz is absolutely in your DNA. The mum that you share with Barbara is, of course, uh, Diana Kind, who was a, an incredible soprano, a wonderful singer in her right, her own right. But yeah. she never took that anywhere, did she? She didn't want no. a professional... She was career. very shy, my mother, very shy. And I think when she wanted to go after a thought about it, her parents, she grew up in that, in that uh, era where it was like a bum's business, you know, you know, a nice Jewish girl doesn't go and do this. So she knows. <laughs> but she loved to sing. Sometimes I would be as a kid singing in the mirror, acting out the albums that I love to sing with. And if she came home, she would get in front of me and take away the mirror. <laughs> Interesting that you were singing around the house and mm -hmm. I suppose kind of imagining yourself, projecting yourself somewhere in the future. Is it a bit of a pinch yourself moment that that trajectory actually happened, that you went on to have this wonderful career? To me, it was a dream come true. And it is my reality, because I was going to be a math teacher. When I was in eighth grade, I thought I was going to be a math teacher. I was overweight. I was, you know, I, I just didn't see myself in show business at that time. But um, that was my love, singing. I loved performing. And it was actually, uh, I had a relative, an aunt that thought I'd never go into the business because I was so shy. But it actually helped get me out of my shyness, you know? Because um, it's like a safe barrier, like you're on stage here and the people are in the audience. So there was so different, you know, than um, felt protective felt protective so I was able to exude more of myself. I read yeah. interviews with your sister where she talked about the fact that your mum really didn't want her going into showbiz. Better to go off and be safe and go to secretarial school or something. Secretarial, go to college, get married, you know, but we always believe in getting a college degree or whatever. Neither one of her daughters got a college degree. My brother did, but we didn't. It's not that my mother didn't want her in it, she was afraid for her when she's a young kid and she's out there alone and, you know. But then your mother must have felt this overwhelming sense of pride to see the incredible achievements that you've both made and the way in which you found your place in that crazy world of show. She was very proud. Nervous when she was watching us perform. She would go in the back of the room or whatever. She would be so nervous. But she, yes, she was very proud. But she was never a braggart. You know, my mom was never a stage mom the farthest thing from it. And uh, she never bragged. People came to her. She didn't go say, you know, my daughter, nothing, nothing like that. She was very simple. She was a school secretary. She did her, she's pr proud of her accomplishments and what she did as a single mother, you know. You were 18, I think it was, Rosalind, when you made your debut on The Ed Sullivan Show. Now, this was the hottest nighttime talk show on the planet. Were you nervous? It scared the hell out of me. And the night that I had to do the show was the big blizzard in New York. People were stuck at home. People were stuck at home to watch, except for those that were stuck in the subway <laughs> for hours. No more scratches for a living like a chicken pecking. So I had a guaranteed audience, you know, people looking in, but that scared me. That definitely, and it was the first time I'm looking into a camera. So it's like, where do I look? Do I look in the lens or do I look at the light? Well, <laughs> you know, um, all these thoughts going through your mind and, and the fact that so many eyes are upon you. What was Ed Sullivan like? He was very lovely when he greeted you after you're finished with your number. And he gave me a nice introduction, you know, um, before I actually appeared on his show, I was in the audience one night. He wanted me to be there because Topol was going to be on. Mm -hmm. And he brought me up from the audience because for, uh, 
they were going to do Fiddler on the Roof in the movies. And he felt that I was perfect for that. It was so funny because I did audition for Norman Jewison. Seven times I went back to be any one of the daughters. Wow. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. But you know what killed it? It was my singing. As Huddle, I sang Far From the Home I Love. And I had a manager at the time who yes. wanted me to sing it like I sing in a nightclub. And I said, no, I'm, so, this is, I'm 16 years old. But he's giving me, you know, and I was following his lead. So I sang <laughs> like a more, uh, you know, adult person, which was the wrong, wrong attempt, you know. But uh, I, I, I would have loved to have done it. You know, you, there are th certain things you're supposed to have. I haven't come to terms with my life that certain things you're supposed to have, whether, you know, whether you want them or not, and certain things you're not. And I think it's all in timing and where life is going. You know, sometimes I think it's just, you can't press for what you wish for at any given moment. It's either going to be there or not. You can be ready for it, you know, but um, what you call karma, what you call, you know, it's God's timing to me. It was about 10 years ago, Rosalind, that you and your sister Barbara first sang together and on stage, and then you went off on a tour. What was that magic moment like when you're both there sharing the spotlight and you get to do a duet? It was phenomenal. It was, um, I had waited for that moment for a long time, but I knew I had to get to my own place in life. Um, to do it. You know, it's something that can't be handed to you. You have to work towards it. It's uplifting. And the, the response from the audience was incredible. It was like 20,000 people. You know, somebody said to me, how do you like to be on? I'm like, I love it. Mm. Because I was waving and it was yelling, hi, Roslyn! <laughs> it was like, but it was the most exhilarating feeling. What was that European tour like for you? Because not only did you get to um, share the stage with your sister, but your nephew, Jason Gould, was on that tour as well. So it must have been this wonderful family dynamic. I mean, forgetting about what was going on on stage, right. but then off stage to have dinners together, a laugh in your hotel. Go shopping, go to the theatre on our day off, go to a movie, play games. Yeah, no, it was really fun. I, I loved it because it was family time. Little known fact, you've been in several of your sister's movies in, in fun little roles, like, for instance, in the main event with Ryan O'Neill, as I remember, you were an aerobics instructor in that. Yeah, I was a, no, I was one of the women in the aerobics class. Aha, uh -huh. right, you're in the aerobics class there. <laughs> um, and then um, her version of A Star Is Born with uh, the fabulous Chris Christopherson, mm -hmm. you're in there too, I think, as a guest when she's winning. Yeah, I was at the, awards, at the award show, I was at her table i i actually read for a role for the the druggie that goes into the car with him oh yes but but diane crittenden the casting director she had me read it like eight different ways she said rosie it's this is great but you're so much alike nobody will you know buy that you're a different person coming in being a druggie you know what, in showbiz, Ros, you really have to be tough. The media is always very keen to create feuds. Oh, my gosh, you're both singers, so, you know, naturally you hate one another. But how do you deal with that? In the beginning, I think it bothered me a lot because, you know, it, it starts trouble between your family, number one. If it was really true, it can start you into a controversy that doesn't exist. Correct. But it, it's sad to me that people can't accept others having, being good. You know, it's like, it's not lessening anybody else. Nobody's getting in your way. Nobody, like, I will never be my sister. I'm Rosie. You know, God bless her. She's an icon. She's a legend. I'm so proud of her. And, um, and she's, she talks out. And I love that too. I love that she's involved. Yes, people sometimes compare us and they try to tear me apart and Barbara taught her everything she knows. No, she didn't. We have genes that came from our mother, that came from our grandfather. And we're similar in some ways because of those genes. And we're different in many other ways. We're different people, but we have a lot of the same values. Of course, I think one of the most outrageous untruths that was told was when you married Randy Stone, Emmy, an Oscar-winning producer, child star. The New York Post claimed that your sister had boycotted your wedding, which was, just, that was an outrageous <laughs> lie. And yes. full credit to your, um, uh, your now late ex-husband, 
for actually writing a note that was blistering in its um, showcasing of that lie. Tell the story of what really went on. Well, our wedding was at her house in Malibu, number one. Number two, she was making yentl and I was trying to wait for her to get home, but she didn't because I wanted her to be my maid of honor, my shoot of honor. And um, she, both she and my brother gave me my wedding because mm -hmm. I didn't have you know, a father and my brother walked me down the aisle and I wanted my sister to very much be there. And we kept pushing it back the date, hoping she would be back in LA, but that never happened. And you know, and she said, well, you gotta go, you know, don't hold up for me. But she made sure that everything was great. I planned my own wedding. I had the greatest time. It was, <laughs> couldn't have been more beautiful on the ranch. I mean, outside on a Sunday afternoon, it was gorgeous. And uh, everything was just taken care of. And she was calling up to see, making sure the candies, the color of the candies and every room in the house was the right color. <laughs> and, and, and her assistant, they were there taking pictures to make sure she got them right away, the pictures yes. from the wedding. Now, there was something about the wedding cake, Rosalind, I understand, about the doves that weren't quite doves. What's that story? <laughs> well, you see, what happened was I ordered this cake from a French bakery. Yes. Called Le Petit Four on Sunset. I know it I well. Had, I, had such fa I had such fun planning my wedding, yes. going tasting and trying on and planning everything. And um, I ordered a cake, but I said to them, I want, you know, I want the white cream, but I want it not like, you know, in France where I want cake, cream, this much cake, this much cream. This much. And they made a cake that was this much cream and this much cake and this much cream and this much cake. So needless to say, you had to go down into the canyon where the wedding was. They had to come off sunset yes. to go down to the ranch and the bumpy ride seems to have broken the cake apart. Now, they weren't, they were not stacked at the time, but they were supposed to be stacked, but they were so broken apart. And Randy had seen them, but he didn't want me to see it. He knew I would be nuts. I would go, oh, what do you mean? What do you mean? This is like bad luck. This is like, what do you mean? And uh, so they like patched it all together. And when it came for us going to uh, cut the cake, I noticed that the cake was not stacked. I'm going, why is it stacked? I said, I'll tell you later. And then we cut into it and I was saying, what is this thing over here? I remember wanting fresh flowers and I wanted little white doves. <laughs> yeah. I got like two pigeons made out of egg whites and cream of tartar with almond slanted eyes. And we couldn't stop laughing. I was like, I, excuse me, they didn't know from doves. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. Oh my gosh, you two must have laughed through the duration of your marriage, right? Oh God, well, we laughed a lot. We laughed a lot until we weren't laughing anymore. But you know what, even when we fought, we laughed. He was one of the great casting directors of Hollywood, wasn't he? I mean, you think of shows like The X-Files, Gillian Anderson, mm -hmm. David Duchovny, they wound up in that show as Skulder and Mully, mm -hmm. Mulder because of, um, because of your Maybe. husband. Yeah, well, he was very good to actors. He was kind, you know, he... Uh, very good heart, very good heart as a casting director. Uh, you and, and Randy had divorced. Um, he then had found another life, but then died in 2007. So young, Rosalind, was, how much of a shock was that to you? I mean, how do you deal with I was in Florida working when I got the call from my niece. And this was just weeks, weeks before we were on the phone and he said, well, you know, we were going to plan Indian food, come over for Indian food. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, even after we got divorced, he said, well, maybe we need to do it. We want to move in together. I said, I've just been there and done that. <laughs> <laughs> but there was always um, a love, I guess, always a love there and a mutual respect. I mean, um, I was so sad, I was, I was like shocked to the nines and I uh, sent something to be put into his, uh, to be buried with him. He was a really good human being. He was good to actors. He was a great casting director. That's how uh -huh. we met when he was, he, he was a runner for Alan Landsberg's casting department. And I was in a show called Ferguson the Taylor uh, when he got to be the casting director. And he came and he called me and he said, I'm going to be at your show. He said, if you go to dinner with me. And uh, we went to dinner and he's inviting me to Hawaii to meet his folks and everything. And he went home and told his friend, I met the girl I'm going to marry. 
Do you feel him around you? Is he a bit like an angel on your shoulder at times? I think he's around. I believe my mom is around. Because mm -hmm. I've had out-of-body experiences with her. I really? had out-of-body experience with my father. It's not too personal. What was that out-of-body experience with your mother like? What happened? I felt something go down in my bed. Mm -hmm. I felt an energy. And it, my bed went down on one side. And I, and I turned inward into the bed and went into fetal position. And I said, Mom, is that you? I, what happens, it's like an energy that leaves your body. It's like you see yourself. You rise above it. And you see yourself. You're down there. You're still down there. But you're having this one-on-one -on -one through the brain, through the mind, mm -hmm. with, a, with a spirit. And I, and I believe that she came to let me know that she's okay. And I think it was the same thing earlier on because I lost my dad when I was 18. And I, I still feel the love. I feel the love. But I even have a picture of my mother, which is in her spirit, is in the, at the end of Light of Love video. Mm -hmm. Just after the credits, the yes. door is open, a friend took a picture, and there's a shape of a woman. And that's your mom in that picture. There she is yeah. with you. What about your dad when, when he came to you in that out-of-body experience? What kind of reconnection was that for you both? I remember out-of-body and trying to go run out-of-body into my mother's room to tell her dad was here. And it was just an absolutely incredible feeling. I mean, I've had, I had an out-of-body when I was really heavy into meditation with, makes it call me crazy, with aliens. Mm -hmm. I, I had a great experience. I had a great experience. I know somewhere through, um, I have been told I've had other lifetimes uh, in Atlantis, Lemuria. I've worked with dolphins. Um, and I've taken that on very seriously. And that's how I feel. And that's how I react with people. I, I want to be loving. I kind of resent when somebody does something to aggravate, make misery. Mm. Because I just want to, the world to be love filled. What does it kill you to open a door for somebody? What does it kill you to say good morning or to be pleasant on the phone with somebody you're doing business with? You know, what, what does it cost? Kindness doesn't cost a dime. It's like a mirror into your heart. You talked before about finding your own voice, which you've done in spades, and you have so many followers around the world, people that love you and have you forged your own path. Was it difficult in the beginning to do that? Or did you just ignore what people were saying, the constant comparisons with your sister and move forward regardless? Well, one of the first reviews I got was something that they talked about how good I was, but it seemed to, to get the attention for herself, she would have to uh, jump from the Eiffel Tower singing the burning of Rome. <laughs> and I didn't go into the business because my sister was a star. I went into it because I love to sing. It's what I spent hours at home acting things out, creating ballets to Exodus, to this, to that. You know, it's like, um, I just, it, it filled me. It filled my heart. It filled my soul. And even though when I was young, I didn't know why I, I wasn't spiritually awake yet. But I was, oh, I always believed in God. I always had spirituality, but I didn't know to what extent my metaphysicality and my universality existed until I had ups and downs and went on a search. Mm -hmm. And I searched enough to find out what my meaning of life is for me and why I'm here. Because that, if you don't know why you're here, how do you move forward? Am I right in, in knowing that you recorded your first album? I think it was like you began the day of your graduation from high school, is that right? Yep, at 9 a.m. Pomp and Circumstance, 12 p.m., Studio B at RCA. <laughs> you have been working on another album, and I know you started, in fact, when, when we spoke back in 2019, you were kind of in the throes of it then, but you do have two songs that are available now on an array of streaming services, and this is a taste to come. In the album, there is Save the Country, which is a remarkable song. Raves in the blinking sun. It's uplifting, it inspires, and it's almost like a, a, a rally call, would you say? Yeah, definitely. 
And I have another rally call also that's in the can that has to, I'm waiting to do a video on called Harvest for the World. Yes. And it's also about, you know, forget the greed and this, you know, people have to value. It's about equality and equity and, you know, people having the same chances in life. And uh, yes. And it's, it's again, another rally song. I just, during the time that this was needed, I said to my producer, I said, I got to put this on the side. We need healing for the country. We need Correct. healing for the country. The records that I'm doing are coming out. I have uh, three more that are already in the can. Mm -hmm. The Harvest for the World, the 11 o'clock song from my show, which is, uh, it only takes a moment and to kiss her now to Jerry Herman tunes. Mm -hmm. Oh, two of his shows. Yeah. And then we did a medley of uh, The Look of Love in the Island, which is incredibly sensual. Mm -hmm. we had those two, I'm, on, I'm working on the video right now for the first one, and then I'll do The Look of Love. Your music brings so much light to so many people all around the world. It has been an absolute joy chatting with you, Rosalind Kind. Thank you, Craig. Every time I'm in your company, your rosy glow is just so nourishing, uplifting, and you know, come away from being with you and you feel fabulous. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. I'm so, you know, my heart is so happy. I'm so oh, happy. good. Be well, stay safe. Well, if you enjoyed that interview with the wonderful Rosalind Kind, you know what you can do? You can hit the subscribe button, which is just down there. It's red. Press that. That way we can keep up to date, you and me, with the fabulous legends that you love, future interviews, but also access the archives. I've chatted with some really great people and I hope you enjoy those too. I'll see you next time. Remember, subscribe. <laughs>